morning and thanks for joining us here on The Real Story. I'm Emma Wolforst. We're now in a mad dash to the 2024 general election with early voting just 10 weeks until polls open. Primaries were held across Connecticut communities this past week to determine those November ballots with one statewide Republican race for a chance at the U.S. Senate. Lifelong Manchester resident and businessman Matthew Corey officially named the GOP candidate to go up against Democratic Senator Chris Murphy, who's been in office since 2013. I did speak with Senator Murphy's team right after his challenger was decided. Nothing specific said about Corey's campaign with the Senate seat that's been blue since 1989. Murphy's team don't seem to be sweating the opposition just yet, but Max Glass, Murphy's campaign manager, said they're instead focused on Democratic candidates and policies across the ballot this election cycle, telling me, quote, Chris is looking forward to working really hard over the next 12 weeks to elect Kamala Harris and Democrats up and down the ballot and win re-election while keeping up his work in the Senate. Well, here with me now, the man who believes that Senate seat could use a change, Matthew Corey, the official GOP nominee now. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I want to start out with reaction this past week. Primaries are not always super exciting to people. We obviously try and get people to get out there and, and vote in every election. But the primaries this year, some big races, one of those yours. You were not the party endorsed candidate after the state GOP convention this year, though. But, you know, Tuesday came around. You saw so many people showing up and showing out for you. The race pretty quickly called, you know, about an hour after polls closed, an hour or two after polls closed. How did that feel Tuesday night when you got that official call? It was a lot of hard work and it wasn't just on myself. It was a lot of hard work from the RTCs around the state and what they did and you can't do it alone. So yeah. all the volunteers and stuff. But look, Jerry ran a great race too. We're both grassroots candidates. We're both at the same mission as trying to make the case why Senator Murphy doesn't deserve another six years. So hats off to their campaign too. And we did speak with the state GOP chairman, Ben Proto, Wednesday morning after primary day and he commended you for getting so much support. He said though, you know, because of low voter turnout, which we tend to see in primaries, unfortunately, every vote really matters, really counts in those races. And he said it was all about people showing up and voting for who they knew. And he said, you know, people knew Matt Corey. So for those who didn't though, for those maybe who didn't go out and vote, and since Connecticut has closed primaries for all those unaffiliated and independent voters who didn't get a chance to vote, what do you want them to know now about who Matt Corey is? Well, I'm a Manchester native, lived here all my life. I joined the United States Navy right out of high school. I served in the Middle East during the 82, 87, uh, during the uh, International Peacekeeping Force. I came back, I worked for the Postal Service for a little while, I worked for the Teamsters for a little while. In uh, 1989, I opened up a small high-rise window cleaning company and had that for 32 years. So there isn't a city or a town that I haven't traveled in and worked <laughs> in. So, and then I opened up a small Irish pub in Hartford, and I, I love my capital city, but I am now over in the East Hartford Golf Course, and I've been there for my sixth season. We have 14 employees, so a blue-collar, hard-working, small business guy. And I know your primary party on Tuesday night was actually at your pub. Yes. That's a, a pretty special moment. And as you just mentioned, I really feel like that's been a, a big primary principle of your campaign is your focus on you being a businessman and you know business friendly representation in Congress. I want to start with that. What does business friendly representation in Congress look like for you? Well, you have to be a, ve a vested interest in the state of Connecticut and I have that vested interest being a small business owner. So when you create policies in Washington DC, you have to know the impacts when you come home. Mm. And for someone like Senator Murphy who's never worked in the private sector his entire life, never signed the front of a paycheck, the policies that he's bringing home is hurting small businesses and large corporations. You know, through my window cleaning company for 32 years, I had a special view of looking through corporate America literally from the outside. Yeah. And so some of the tax policies that Senator Murphy's bringing home has sent a lot of corporations overseas. We used to have U.S. Surgical here in, in Connecticut. Now they're over in Ireland because of the corporate tax rate. So there's implications with bad tax policies that affect everybody, small business owners, workers. Just it, it's hurting this Connecticut economy. And when it comes to workers, some people have brought up, you know, Senator Murphy, who you're now attempting to unseat, has put forward some 
more worker-centric policy, you know, whether it's federal minimum wage or policies like schedules that work, da- work act or workforce mobility, which, you know, he says are all about bolstering rights and good conditions for employees. How do you strike a balance there between really nurturing business owners, whether it be small businesses or, or corporations here in Connecticut, while also protecting workers' be- best interests in the well, state? Well, so you can't be pro-worker and anti-business at mm. the same time. It doesn't work. You have Senator Murphy bragging about UAW jobs in Tennessee, where we have UAW jobs right here at Colt Firearms. You can't have it both ways. You have to find that delicate balance. Right now, we're losing 400 jobs at Sikorsky Helicopter. Uh, I used to work for the largest trucking company. It was Roadway Freight, you had YRC. 30,000 jobs lost. So you have to find that delicate balance. But if you've never worked in the private sector, you've never ran a business, you don't know the implications of those regulations that you're putting on small businesses and the cost, that's the cost of doing business. I know a lot of people in the small, that have small businesses that are now working by themselves because they can't afford to hire people. And that's, that's the effect that we're having. To give somebody a raise just to give them a raise, it, that, a lot of that doesn't make sense. So he's compensating for the cost of living due to high taxes and forcing those costs of living wages onto small businesses doesn't work. You mentioned being a Teamster previously. You know, you're no stranger to unions. How does that factor into business policy you'd want to see brought forward? Look, I've worked on a lot of union jobs around Connecticut, and most of those union jobs are rebuilding schools. Mm. And so it's just falling through taxpayer money back in. I worked on the last two cranes in Hartford. It was 1989 in the Goodwin Tower and Hartford 21 in 2006. If you drive around the country, you fly around the country, you see cranes everywhere, Atlanta, Charlotte, uh, Denver. We have no economic growth here. You have taxes that are so out of control here in the state of Connecticut, and energy costs that are unbelievable. So everybody that looked at their energy bills, whether it's electric or gas, Senator Murphy's proposing a tax on natural gas, any type of energy, fossil fuels. We can't afford that anymore. People can't afford to put groceries on on their table. They can't afford to go to the gas station. It's unaffordable, and that's affecting small businesses. Or I were, I'm in the hospitality business. Mm. We've had so many businesses closed down. You had plenty of them closed down here in Hartford. I can name a ton of them. But it's just you can't stay open. And mom and pop stores like that are the fabric of our communities. They sponsor little league teams. They sponsor whatever benefits that are going on in their community, and we are losing sight of that. So a lot of the tax revenue from across the state will go to you know different programs whether it be statewide or federal you know social security medicare and we know that that is top of mind for voters funding for both is running out so if you were in congress right now when these really big decisions are being made by federal lawmakers about what to do when it comes to programs like that you know how would you swing so if you look at what they did with the new green energy deal that they mm-hmm. did in washington they robbed 168 billion dollars from medicare Medicare. Stop stealing from people that have worked all their lives. Medicare, Social Security, we have to shore that up. They're taking that money out of, out of the Medicare and Social Security now to take care of benef- people that are coming here illegally. You're kicking veterans in the streets because you're housing illegal aliens. They're overwhelming our hospitals. They're overwhelming our schools. People need to come across the border in a legal way. But We can't take from the benefits that people work for their entire lives. When it comes to what the government spends on and what they shouldn't, 35 trillion and growing national debt, your party is is really the party of, in general, cutting down on spending. So, you know, where do you fall when it comes to that? Well, you can't increase taxes with no spending cuts. Now, Senator Murphy's in for a five to seven trillion dollar tax increase at 35 trillion. We're spending almost a trillion a year just to maintain that debt with interest rates. Mm. So we have to become energy independent, use some of that oil money on federal lands to help pay down the deficit. There's plenty of programs to do that. There was more revenue coming in under President Trump's Tax Cuts and Jobs Act than any time in history. Mm. So, but what didn't happen was they didn't cut spending. I blame that on both parties down in Washington, and we need to cut spending. There's plenty of government waste going over there. There is a disagreement on what money is going to, and I feel like, you know, almost no congressional candidate is really running and going into Congress campaigning on sending money abroad, but that is a really big topic of, of conversation right now in recent years. Conflicts do happen, and foreign affairs and aid decisions sort of end up in federal lawmakers' laps. Voters are headed to the polls 
come November, thinking about the situations in Gaza, in Ukraine, where do you stand on foreign aid spending there? Well, look at, look at uh, Senator Murphy's failed foreign policy in Iran. He was an appeaser to the Iranian mullahs. So instead of putting sanctions on American oil and energy, he relieved sanctions on, on Iran, who is funding the Hezbollah, who is funding, funding the Houthis, who is funding Hamas. Now, he'd wanted to take the Houthis terrorists off the terrorist organization watch list. This is the most naval engagement we had in years. So and then he wants to withhold money from Israel, whether it's intelligence information or, or pinpoint weaponry. This is completely wrong. So when this administration embraces whatever it takes to be successful in Ukraine. Well, what does that mean? We've already sent $175 billion over there. We don't know where that money went. There should be an inspector general looking to where those monies went. But why are we talking about a peace deal over there? Mm -hmm. Senator Murphy's on the foreign Rel Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Why isn't he talking about a peace deal with Putin? All they wanted to do is they didn't want to put NATO too close to their borders. If Ukraine would stay neutral, and that's what Putin was asking for, we wouldn't be in this situation, but you can't leave from weakness, and that's why all our money is going over there. When President Trump's administration was in power, Senator Murphy was against every foreign policy that the, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo was over there, uh, President Trump was over there. He actually went over to Iran and undermined this administ uh, pre previous administration. There was peace around the world. So it's peace through strength, not peace through appeasement. And so if you look at Senator Murphy's foreign policy, there's a lot of death that follows this administration, and it's unfortunate that we see a lot of death in the Ukraine. Connecticut's other senator, Richard Blumenthal, he's not up for re-election until 2028, but he's really been a big proponent of aid to Ukraine. I just spoke with him this past week after getting back from his sixth trip in two years, and he was there with Republican Senator Lindsey Graham. There has been bipartisan support for sending more aid. Is that something that if you were in that Senate seat right now, you would not agree with? I would agree with it, if, as long as you had an inspector general, knowing where that money went. My, my thing is I would support President Trump's administration who is seeking peace mm. and negotiation. When is the war going to end? Where, what is the outcome? Now you have Ukraine invading Russia. This is a very dangerous situation over there. So to say we'll just have an open checkbook and send all the money to Ukraine until we want the results that we're looking for, that's not the way to do foreign policy. Foreign policy is bringing people together. And Senator Murphy has failed to do that. You know, we know peace is definitely, you know, complicated in a lot of those foreign situations. But I want to get back here to domestic policy because we know a lot of these foreign and global issues obviously have impacts back here at home in Connecticut. One is, you know, immigration. Where are you standing when it comes to immigration policy? Well, Senator Murphy was bragging about that bipartisan border bill that failed. Even Democrats voted against that bill. So when you still have open borders, you can let over 5,000 people come across the border, and then you give the president emergency powers to shut down that border, you can shut that border down after one person. The problem is there's catch and release. There's no border security. There's an HR2 bill sitting on Senator Schumer's desk that should be passed today. Well, and what does that mean? If you're waiting for asylum, wait, wait for it in the near, nearest country next to your country before you come into the, to the United States. Why should taxpayers pay for that five to seven years down the road while they're waiting for asylum, putting them up in free housing, putting them up in schools, putting them up in taking advantage of our medical system? This is not fair to people that are struggling in the inner cities and in suburbs, not fair to our veterans who are living in the streets. So we need to secure our border. We need to have asylum. But catch and release is the biggest thing. We have people that are getting killed by illegals here that are not being deported. Uh, we had Casey Chadwick's mother, who lives in Norwich, she is lonely because she lost a daughter to an illegal alien that should have been deported. There was Casey Chadwick, I can name um, Nancy, uh, uh, Moran, she lost her daughter to, and it's just name after name. How many more angel moms are we going to bring into this country? It's just, it's, it's a terrible situation. but. Something needs to be done about that. And local, state, and, and federal law enforcement need to work together to remove the people that are committing the most heinous crimes in this country. You've spoken before about the so-called remain in Mexico policy, which you know meant certain asylum seekers who were coming across the border would be sent back to Mexico, the southern border, that is, to wait for their pending asylum claims. That really brings up not only the idea of securing or shutting down the southern border, but then, you know, what about the people who are already here and, and have maybe been here for a long time? We are, we are a compassionate nation. I would focus on the people that are committing the most heinous crimes. Mm. And 
this thing needs to be done case by case. Mm. But when you let 10 million people in here unidentified, you have human trafficking, you have fentanyl, which was found right here in the capital city of Hartford High School. You have human trafficking with young minors that nobody knows where they're at. These are huge issues. So talking about who to remove at the end of getting rid of the people that are committing the most crimes, that's a different situation. And that's something that needs to be handled with delicacy because you have people that are brought here yeah that didn't know they were brought here because they were young kids. And we, we, we are a compassionate nation, we understand that. When it comes to crime and safety, you have called for, quote, unequivocal support for law enforcement. What does that mean to you? You know, what does that statement mean to you? What could that really look like when it comes to policy? Well, when you have Senator Murphy embracing and fawning over the Kamala Harris administration, she wants to defund police, she wants to defund ICE, that's not embracing law enforcement. Our communities are not safe unless you back law enforcement. And I don't know where Senator Murphy's community lives in, but there's a lot of communities in that you see of a lot of shootings around that are happening in Connecticut. East Haven police are being attacked. We need to support law enforcement, give them the tools they need to keep our communities safe. We need to support ICE, and we need to support the federal law enforcement working with state and local officials to remove people that are committing heinous crimes in this country. Obviously, every field, you know, will have those who aren't following the rules. And we have seen cases in law enforcement where officers are not doing their job correctly. Where is the line for you when it comes to, you know, you, you say supporting law enforcement, but also is there a line there then for, for prosecuting those who aren't doing the job correctly? Well, that's where they have internal affairs. So internal affairs takes care of officers that, are, that have multiple complaints against them. Look, we need policing in our community and we need the police to work with the local community. And I, I have been in a business in Hartford for over 32 years. Hartford Police is some of the most upstanding officers that have walking beats, that work with their community, community leaders. And that's what we need all around this country. Another top issue for people, really we've heard from lots of voters, are health care costs and, and policy as a whole. So I, I specifically want to ask you, you know, reproductive rights do continue to be in legislative hands, and we know that it's, you know, a lot of those things are protected here in Connecticut, but voters, you know, do still have concerns about what's happening at the federal level. When it comes to abortion and abortion medications, what do you believe on that I do issue? I not stand with a, a, a nationwide abortion ban or a federal ban. I stand with the citizens of the state of Connecticut. Yeah. The law is settled here in the state of Connecticut. I stand with the citizens. So, which we have heard, I've heard at least from a lot of Republican candidates as well as state legislators, that really seems to be the platform here is keeping this a state's rights issue. Is that what I'm understanding? Yes. So in our last minute or so here, you had mentioned a little bit before, but we know throughout your campaign, you've kind of labeled yourself as a Trump guy. You've specifically run on how, you know, you don't shy away from supporting former President Donald Trump, but that's historically here in Connecticut not maybe done so well for certain candidates and, and maybe even some more moderate Republicans here in the state. What's your response to that? Do you have any concerns that standing with him could mean issues for you in your campaign for the general election? Not at all. It's not about, if, if this election is about personality, then okay, mm -hmm. you don't have to like somebody, but this is about policy. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time in my history probably ever that you have two administrations with both, both have records. Now Kamala Harris is attached to President Biden's administration. And from what my commander in chief said, President Ronald Reagan, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And what is wrong with President Trump's policies? We had peace overseas, we had a secure border, and we had an economy that worked for everyone. So if you looked past all the noise, were you doing better, whether you were uh, working single mom, single dad, parents, buying an affordability, uh, were you a small business, large corporation, were you doing better under the previous administration or the current administration? We all know the answer to that. So look past the noise and go with policy that's going to help America and bring peace around the world and secure our nation. And we do know, our, our last thing I want to get to here, we do know that a lot of people in Connecticut do disagree. It is a very blue-leaning state, and this seat specifically has been blue since 1989. So do you really think that that could change this November in 2024? I think if people look who has a vested interest in the state of Connecticut, who actually lives in the state of Connecticut, raises families, and, and has a small business in Connecticut, understands the pain and suffering that we're going through under this economy, I think they would look at a guy like myself who's brought up as a blue-collar, hard-working, family-of-seven person and just 
knows what it takes and loves a state that didn't move out of state, they would take a look at my campaign and take a look at who they're sending to Washington. Well, Matt Corey, thank you so much for being here with us. Thank I'm sure so we'll be catching up before November as you're now the official Republican nominee for thank Senate. Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor. There's still more to come here, though, on The Real Story. We're continuing to break down the rest of your 2024 ballot, the votes and, in, and incidents that decided this primary and races from Capitol Hill to Connecticut State Capitol. What are the stakes and what comes next? We're getting into the details next. Stay with us.